Today we're going to begin lesson number three in our series of angelology. And in this series, we're going to be speaking and addressing the classifications of angels. And we're going to talk about the seraphim, the cherubim, and uh, the archangels. The Bible actually speaks to us of elect angels. And for many of you, this might be new, but the Bible actually speaks of a classification of angels called watchers. And uh, we'll also learn that in various realms of theology, they divide uh, angels even into more categories than that. But we're going to stick with the classic classification of angels from the Bible in this study. And we're going to begin reading in Hebrews chapter 1. If you have your Bible, Hebrews and the very first chapter, and go down to verse 6. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, and we're going to read down through verse 14. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with the scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. He also says to the Son, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing. But you are always the same. You will live forever. And God never said to any of the angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. That is one of the classic texts in the Bible, passages in the Bible that deals with angels. And as we begin, let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we never open up the Holy Bible without considering our deep need of you and all that we do. It is the Holy Spirit, the Scripture teaches us, that guides us into all truth. And I am only a vessel and a voice box, but I yield myself to the content of sacred scripture. And I pray in these moments as we share together with every life, every listener, through many means of technology whereby this will be scattered like seed throughout the world. My number one prayer is that not one person who ever listens to me in this teaching or any other presentation or broadcast or message, my prayer is that not one of them would be lost. My prayer is that each and every one of them would be ready to meet the Lord when you come and we know that you're coming very soon. You told us in Matthew's Gospel and the 24th chapter, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. And so I pray that as we unfold the teaching today, that you would anoint ears and minds and spirits to receive and to retain the truth of God. Make us more like Jesus every day and less like ourselves. Cleanse us of every sin, 
every stain, every iniquity, every transgression. I pray that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you would wash us and make us holy in your eyes. We'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And at the end of this time that we spend together in the Bible, when I extend the invitation, perhaps for those who are not ready to meet the Lord, I ask that you would give them faith and courage to do what they ought to do. And may this day be their hour of decision. We pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. In lesson one on angelology, we covered a fairly fundamental introduction to angelology and we taught from the scripture uh, do angels really exist? Uh, when were angels created? Where do angels come from? What did Jesus teach us about the angels? And uh, much more. In lesson number two, we taught on 12 Bible facts about angels. And we walked you through the Bible and shared with you uh, what we would consider the most important factual statements in the Bible about angels. And today in lesson three, we're going to be discussing the different classifications of angels. Some of you that follow our ministry have only been saved uh, perhaps for a short amount of time. Many times those who receive the Lord in our lost lamb events that we do all over the world. Uh, in the days ahead, I'm going to be doing an evangelism seminar in Belfast, Ireland. And God has given us the privilege through the years to hold lost lamb crusades and events in going on 60 countries of the world. And so I always in our teaching style try to make room for those that are just beginning they're just buying a Bible, just beginning to learn the books of the Bible. And uh, I do my best not to leave you behind in the dust of teaching and, and theology. I do my best to make it easy for you to learn. But I also am going to uh, not underestimate the ability that God has given you to learn and to be a student. Because God told us in the Bible the Apostle Paul wrote these words in the New Testament. The scripture says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we have been mandated by God to be students of the Bible, if indeed we are followers of Christ. Jesus taught us that we should be disciples and followers and learners. But when we do this, we're going to do it in such a way and provide it for you on various formats. And I hope that you follow us on all of the social media formats if you use social media. I'm perfectly aware that social media is a two-edged sword. Uh, there is a lot of meat and spiritual nutrition and edification available online. And uh, there is also a great flow of secular sewage that is available there as well, and I hope that you'll use holy discretion uh, in your social media applications. But today you're going to learn the difference between seraphim, cherubim. We're going to talk about archangels, or perhaps should we say archangel, singular. We'll come back to that. And there are other classifications of angels depending upon the textbooks that you're studying on angelology. Uh, some add multiple layers of classifications of angels. Uh, to be honest with you, I think some of it is a little bit of a stretch. Uh, as always, we're going to do our best to condense it. Our teaching policy is if the Bible says it, we'll make it clear. But if the Bible does not say it, we're not going to try to establish uh, something and make it dogmatic if the Bible indeed uh, has little or nothing to say. And you're going to find that out today because in angelology uh, we have some of this scholarship debate 
And uh, so be ready as you're taking notes because I am going to touch upon some of those debates. But I am going to show you in Scripture what is referred to as the elect angels, uh, another classification. And there's another one that I think probably is the least known of all of the classifications of angels. And that would be what the Bible calls, or at least what's interpreted in the English language, as watchers. And uh, for many of you, that will be brand new Bible information. And so let's get ready and let's get started. Open your Bible, and uh, as always, if you're brand new, uh, buy a notebook or open up and create digital uh, notebook and take notes, and you'll have access. Uh, one of the, I think, might be considered an advantage of uh, being a part of our ministry and following this ministry is that I unfold for you uh, my lifetime of Bible study, and I share it with you. I'm saving you uh, decades of walking with Christ and learning through the school of hard knocks. I not only willingly, but love to open up my life notes and my life studies. I was uh, trying to get an estimate on the uh, books in my library, and between uh, books through the years that I've purchased and put into my library. And uh, I'm talking about theology books, not uh, secular books, just books that are textbooks and study books and uh, concordances and various tools of uh, Greek and Hebrew lexicons and so on. Uh, I think safely and conservatively, there's, there's well over 20,000 books between books that I own and books that uh, I have on a digital library at this point in my life and purchase books all the time. So uh, I'm doing a lot of the uh, heavy work for you and then you have the privilege of just walking behind and that's what a minister is supposed to do. I'm not in any way boasting about that. I'm just saying you have an advantage that some people don't have and uh, I take that commitment to you uh, from my heart to your heart, from my mind to your mind, I take that very seriously. And I think if you follow this for any amount of time, you know by now uh, that we never sit before you and record or tape or put together broadcasts or podcasts uh, that uh, have not been well prepared, prayed over, organized. And so with that said, number one, if you're taking notes, under angelology and the classifications of angels, let's talk about seraphim. And that is spelled S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. Seraphim. This is one of the classifications of the angels that are clearly taught to us in Scripture. Uh, the word translated in our English language as seraphim, taken from and we find them both in Old and New Testament, but a very loose translation of that would be fiery ones or burning ones. And uh, you heard me right. These are angels that through language could be described as the fiery ones or the burning ones. Now, how do we come to that conclusion? Uh, it's because of the fiery image that is often associated with the presence of God in the Bible. And if we were to start to go down a trail of theology and talk about the presence of God and fire, we could go to the burning bush where Moses in that wilderness place encountered the very presence of God and received vocal instruction and the bush the Bible said was on fire, but not consumed. And there are multiple places in the Bible where we could talk about the fiery presence of God. When the children of Israel in the Old Testament were led in the wilderness, they were led by a cloud by day and fire by night. And so the word seraphim, actually has a rendering and translation that could be equated 
as fiery ones or burning ones. And uh, by the way, the word seraphim is plural, and the word seraph is singular. And so if you're talking about a single angel, you're talking about, in this classification, a seraph, S-E-R-A-P-H. Seraph is the singular, seraphim is the plural. Now, what is the assignment of seraphim as we study the scriptures? Seraphim have the assignment and the unique ability of praising God in such a way that separates them from the other classifications of angels as you're going to see. Uh, in their proclamation found in the prophet Isaiah, uh, they walk in the mountains of God declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The seraphim walk in the presence and in the mountains of God and praise and proclaim the perfect holiness of God. They are angels who have an assignment of keeping the standard of the holiness of God always before the attention of all in their presence. As a matter of fact, uh, let's take time to go into the Bible, go into the Old Testament, into one of the major prophets by the name of Isaiah, and in Isaiah, go to the sixth chapter, Isaiah chapter 6, and let me read some verses to you. Uh, I want you, as you take notes, not only to receive teaching, but I want you to have a saturation of biblical support to know what we're basing the teaching upon. So Isaiah chapter 6, and go down to verse 1, and this is a passage that deals with the cleansing of the prophet Isaiah and his divine call as a prophet. Isaiah 6 and verse 1, It was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim. Highlight that. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory, and their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Uh, what an incredible passage in the Bible uh, on angels. And we see seraphim identified here in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And again, the seraphim, their divine assignment is to proclaim and to praise the holiness of God. And a part of that assignment is when they are in the presence of humanity, as they were with Isaiah in this vision, their proclamation of the perfect holiness of God is a call to cleansing to those of us who are human and created in the image of God. God's desire is for us to live a holy life. And Isaiah here is in a vision and having this encounter with seraphim. What we also learn from Isaiah in this passage is that the angels that are classified as seraphim have six wings, two that cover their face, two that cover their feet, and two with which they have the ability 
to fly. And so these are mighty angels of God that are unique in their creation, as you're going to learn. Not all angels look like seraphim. Not all angels, of course, are seraphim. And with that said, let's go to the second classification of angels, and let's talk a little bit about cherubim. Now, one of the things that I hope that you'll understand, and if you've been a part of our ministry and you've allowed us to be a trusted voice in teaching you the Bible and teaching you Bible prophecy, you have heard me say before, but for the new students and those who are listening for the first time, it is never our intent when we do Bible study with you and when we teach theology, and in this particular case, we're teaching the theology of angelology, and we're going to immediately after this series on angels move into demonology. Uh, it's never my desire to give you an exhaustive uh, study on the subject. I don't want to uh, bury you, and I've also learned by my conversations with people that I meet on the roads in my uh, continuous travels, uh, many times people will say, you go too fast or uh, you're covering things that I've never heard before. I wish you'd go into greater detail. And uh, so always remember that I'm doing my best to give you what I would call the theological high points on the subject. I'm not trying to give you enough information and then going to ask you at the end of the lesson or the teaching or the broadcast or the podcast uh, to write me an in-depth master's level uh, paper on the subject, I want you to have substantial, solid Bible understanding of these subjects, and I want them to be transferable. Uh, what do you mean transferable? I want you to be able to understand these in such a way that you can teach them to your family and teach them to your children if you're a mom or a dad or your grandchildren. Uh, I, I know that it might not be the most interesting and provocative thing that a child will ever hear, but I would hope that many of you would sit down from time to time with your family and take these uh, that are available in video and broadcast and uh, YouTube and our Facebook Live archives, etc., and if you're following us on those platforms, you can transfer these teachings right up to your big screen 4K TV. Or if time uh, goes on, maybe some of you will be at 8K. But you have the ability to go back at any point and listen and re-listen until you've absorbed the teaching. And I want to challenge you uh, to do that. All right, number two, if you're taking notes, cherubim. C-H-E-R-U-B-I-M, cherubim. They are most often described in the scriptures uh, as having wings and feet and hands. Uh, well, let's just go right into the Bible and discover that. Go over to uh, the major prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel chapter 10 Ezekiel chapter 10 and go down to verse 20 and we'll read through verse 22. These were the same living beings. Now, pause right there and if you want to in your Bible, highlight uh, those two words, living beings. Because as I'll get to in the moments ahead, there are uh, some in the realm of scholarship and angelology and theologians uh, that divide and subdivide and, and uh, in my opinion, get a little carried away with what I would call biblical classifications of angels and uh, living beings uh, from that position of scholarship. That would be one of the classifications that uh, some in theology would spend time dividing. But I think as you're going to see here, uh, living beings or cherubim, or living beings uh, could be another uh, name for angels in a generic sense. Anyway, important for you to know. Ezekiel 10 verse 20, these were the same 
living beings I had seen beneath the God of Israel when I was by the Kibar River. I knew they were cherubim, for each had four faces and four wings and what looked like human hands under their wings. And their faces were just like the faces of the beings I had seen at the Kibar. And they traveled straight ahead just as the others had. So in this passage, what do we learn about cherubim? Well, in this particular passage, the Bible clearly tells us that they had four wings. Now, how many wings did seraphim have? Six wings. So here is a visual way, if you ever encounter an angel, and one day, if Christ is Lord of your life, you will. In heaven, you will fellowship with the holy angels. But in the scriptures, we see here in Ezekiel 10 that different from the seraphim, who have six wings, two that cover their face, two that cover their feet, two with which they fly. The cherubim have four wings. And the Bible says four faces. There is a lot of debate uh, on the subject of what the four faces of cherubim would be. I don't think in this level of teaching, again, we're not trying to get you to write a master's paper when you're done with this, and uh, most of you that are listening are not working on a PhD in angelology. Uh, I don't think it would be the best use of our time uh, to go into the depths of academic arguments that really have no profit in my life or in your life. But here I'll just leave it at what the scripture says, four faces and four wings. Uh, some theologians teach that uh, there are four faces, one that faces north, south, east, west, but the scripture never clarifies that. Uh, the scripture never gives us uh, the ability to dogmatically teach that the four faces cover the four points of a compass but the Bible does say they had four faces. Now, as I've taken the time to explain that, let me throw in a theological curveball. Uh, as long as you're in the book of Ezekiel, go over to the 41st chapter. Ezekiel chapter 41 and verse 18, and I'm going to read through verse 20. All the walls were decorated with carvings of cherubim, each with two faces. And there was a carving of a palm tree between each of the cherubim. One face, that of a man, looked toward the palm tree on one side. The other face, that of a young lion, looked towards the palm tree on the other side. The figures were carved all along the inside of the temple, from the floor to the top of the walls, including the outer wall of the sanctuary. Now, have we uncovered a contradiction in the Bible? Of course not. The Bible is inerrant. There is no error in the scripture. There is no uh, contradiction in the scripture. What we simply learn from this is that it is quite possible that there is a variance in the physical appearance of the cherubim, some of which, as we read, had four faces, some of which had two faces. And so there is a possibility that there are uh, different appearances of the cherubim and how they were created. Again, some theologians try to go into a depth of explaining as to why some cherubim might be greater in power and some lesser in power. 
But because the scripture is not absolutely clear on that, I'm not going to wander with you uh, down that confusing road. Uh, we've talked about what is the assignment of the seraphim. The assignment of the seraphim was to praise God, to proclaim and to praise the holiness of God. What is the assignment of the cherubim? Cherubim were considered to be angels who guarded sacred things. And if you're taking notes, write that down. The assignment of the cherubim is to guard sacred things. The assignment of the seraphim to praise and to proclaim the holiness of God. The assignment of the cherubim, their assignment as we see in the scripture seems to be they had the assignment of guarding sacred things. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, we find that the cherubim there guarded uh, the tree of life. Uh, Genesis is the very first book in your Bible. Why don't you turn there and let's highlight that. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 23 and 24. Genesis chapter 3 verses 23 and 24 so the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And after sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword. There's that fiery image again that we spoke of in the infancy of this third lesson. He placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And so here is the very first place in the Bible that we see the divine assignment of the cherubim is to guard sacred things. In 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4, they guarded the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. In Exodus chapter 26 and verse 31, figures of cherubim were embroidered in the temple veil. And in 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 26, cherubim lavished Solomon's temple. And so they were even used in the decoration woven in and uh, carvings, statues, guarding sacred things. Perhaps the most important thing that I want you to remember about the cherubim and uh, all the classifications of the angels, I want you to know their divine assignments. The seraphim proclaim and praise the holiness of God. The cherubim protect sacred things. Let me just, for those that do take notes, let me give you those verses again uh, because the most common uh, connection with the ministry on our Bible studies and on our broadcast understanding Bible prophecy with Tiff Shuttlesworth, uh, people sometimes say, I wasn't able to keep up with some of the verses that you quoted. And so let me take the time just to give those to you if you're writing them down. When we're talking about the classic passages in the Bible where we see the seraphim, uh, excuse me, the cherubim guarding sacred things, we find them first in Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. In 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4, over the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, in Exodus chapter 26 and verse 31, there we see the figures of the cherubs embroidered in the temple veil. 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 26, cherubim lavished Solomon's temple. So in the study of angelology, uh, I'm putting this out there because I always want you to know that we're trying to learn. 
uh, the purpose of my Bible study and the Bible teaching and the style of which that I do teach is I'm not trying to convert you to all of my personal opinions on Bible subjects. No. Uh, a good Bible teacher, someone that has integrity in unveiling for you the truth of the Bible, uh, is not trying to build their case. They're only trying to show you what does the Bible say. That's why so many of the titles of our messages, whether it's on video or YouTube or Facebook or podcasts, so many of our teachings begin with what does the Bible say about and then whatever the subject is. Because it doesn't matter what my opinion is. It doesn't matter what your denomination believes or somebody else's denomination believes. The only thing that matters is what did God say in the Bible. And so as I teach and as I unfold these truths for you, uh, I'm not in any way uh, afraid to tell you that there are various opinions. Now, if that opinion cannot be supported by the Bible, I'm not going to give it much attention, as will be the case right now. But in the study of angelology, not all scholars agree that seraphim and cherubim are angels. Uh, I've taken time to do some teaching on seraphim. I've taken some time to do some teaching on cherubim. I've stayed in the Bible and read some classic passages and given you some of the great verses in the Bible that support what we're teaching. But with that said, I'm going to be honest and tell you that in the world of academics, not all scholars agree. And that can be pretty much said on any subject in the Bible. Because just as there is in the world, we have uh, conservative scholars and we have liberal scholars. And today we have ultra-liberal scholars and a myriad of points of view in between each one. Here's why there is some disagreement among Bible scholars as to seraphim and cherubim not being in fact angels. The reason for that debate on the proper classification in Scripture of these first two that we've covered is neither are clearly identified as angels in the Bible. They are not clearly identified as angels in the Bible. Now, I know for some of you, perhaps your eyes have widened if you've been a longtime student of the Bible, or maybe you grew up in church or attended Sunday school, and you have some kind of fundamental background on the truths of the Bible, uh, to find out today that neither seraphim or cherubim are spoken of or classified specifically in the scriptures as angels uh, may be new to you, but that is factual. If you're going to be uh, down to the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T in teaching only what is in the scripture, those scholars would be accurate in saying there is no place <clears throat> in the Bible where seraphim and cherubim are called angels. And, uh, but both seraphim and cherubim in the Bible exhibit all of the nature of angels is taught in Scripture. They all serve God just as angels do in the Scripture. They all have the same uh, servanthood, divine assignments, etc., as we've been learning, as do the angels. Therefore, again, logically as well as theologically, many scholars call seraphim and cherubim angels. If you're interested, I personally believe that by my study of Scripture, I can find no other way of putting them into a separate theological box of definition. Uh, it would seem, as I've said, both logical and theological, that both seraphim and cherubim are angels. I believe that they are. I'm not going to get dogmatic with those scholars who argue there's nothing in the scripture that calls them specifically angels in the passages. They can feel free to go gray over that. It's not of my concern. 
Number three in our classification uh, study of angels, let's talk about the archangels, or perhaps should we say more biblically accurate, archangel singular. Archangel comes uh, when you study it from uh, the Greek. Uh, I do not have uh, a background in biblical Greek and biblical Hebrew, but I do have uh, a substantial library on uh, Greek and Hebrew lexicons. I have an academic uh, mentor in my life who both reads and writes original Bible languages. Uh, I spent uh, two hours on the phone uh, with him yesterday uh, discussing things. And uh, so if you've never been to Bible college or you've never been to seminary and you want to do some more study on original languages, there are books available uh, that can help you. Uh, Probably the first book, if you're taking notes, write this down. The first book that I would recommend, and for many of you, the only book that I would ever recommend if you're going to be a committed student of the Bible, and you should be, is buy a Strong's Concordance. S-T-R-O-N-G apostrophe S. Strong's Concordance. If you don't have that in your library, highly recommend it. And uh, what that concordance does is it literally shows you every word in the Bible. It shows you uh, what the Hebrew definition is from the Old Testament, what the Greek is, a little bit of Aramaic uh, where necessary. And with one book, you can open up a book and you can see what the original Greek and Hebrew is. And that'll save you $200,000 in education in several years of your life. So with that said, let's talk about archangels. Archangel comes from the Greek and it means chief angel. That's what it means fundamentally. An archangel is a chief angel. From what we can glean from the Bible, the archangel is the highest rank of all of the classifications of the angels that we see in the scriptures. Very important. If you're taking notes, be sure to write that down. From what we can glean from the Scripture, the archangel, the chief angel, would be the highest ranking angel in all of the classifications of angels in our Bible study. Many students of the Bible are also surprised to learn that that word archangel is found nowhere in the Old Testament. The word archangel. Now there are archangels, uh, angel, singular, uh, in the Old Testament, and I'm going to come to that, but if you're taking notes, the word archangel is never found in the Old Testament. The Bible only attributes the rank of archangel to one angel, and that archangel is Michael. Now, if I were passing out a test, that would be a question on the test, and it would have high point value. Very important that you understand this. Let me give it to you again for those that are taking it down. The Bible only attributes the rank of archangel to one angel. And that angel is Michael. Michael's the only archangel in the Bible that's called specifically by name and then called Michael the archangel. Now, you know why I was pausing as we began to talk about this third classification why I hesitated to say, now let's study this third classification, archangels. Because we have no archangels in the scripture. One passage, and we'll get to that, but there's only one archangel in the Bible with name, and that is Michael the archangel. Uh, By the way, the name Michael means who is like 
God. And names are important in the Bible. It would not be accidental that God named this unique, specific angel, Michael, without that reference. And Michael means who is like God. Now, many through the years uh, would say, wait a minute, you forgot the archangel Gabriel. But Gabriel is never mentioned in the scripture as being an archangel. Gabriel's involvement in major Bible events is why many people would consider him an archangel. Uh, he announced the birth of Jesus. He announced the birth of John the Baptist. He was the angel that appeared to Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, and spoke to him about specific instruction. And because of the high level of involvement in some of the most important revelations in the New Testament that became a part of the New Covenant, many people assume that Gabriel is an archangel. But there is no reference specifically in the Bible of Gabriel ever being called an archangel. The angel Michael, however, is uh, mentioned in your Bible as an archangel angel, both in the Old Testament and in the New. Uh, let's make sure you have these as well. Let's go to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel and the 10th chapter. Daniel chapter 10. And let me begin reading at verse 4. Daniel chapter 10, verse 4. And I'm going to read down through verse 12. On April 23rd, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing. With a belt of pure gold around his waist, his body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet, now let me just pause as I'm reading this, you need to know that this is the most vivid description of the archangel Michael in all of the Bible. So let me read on. His body looked like a precious gem, his face flashed like lightning, his eyes flamed like torches, his arms and feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. Let me pause right there, uh, just totally out in left field, but many times people would say, there's nothing in the Bible that supports being slain in the Spirit. Uh, some people perhaps attend a church, and for the first time in their life, uh, they see somebody slain in the spirit and people fall like they're dead people. And it, it freaks some people out that are not used to that or come from a denomination where there have been absolutely uh, no room in services for anything but liturgy, no signs, no wonders, no miracles, no prayer for the sick, no healing, no uh, supernatural testimonies, just straight liturgy week after week if they've attended church. You can imagine going to a church and seeing somebody prayed for and it appears like they've dropped dead. Well, this is one of the passages in the Bible uh, that would support that. Uh, the presence of God with this archangel Michael was so substantial, Daniel said, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. Let's read on. Just then a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And then the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. 
So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up, still trembling. Then he said, Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. Wonderful passage, by the way, on the theology of fasting and prayer and answered prayer. Let's read on. I have come in answer to your prayer. Pause again. Here we learn that angels can be summoned into the involvement of our lives through fasting and through prayer. Verse 13. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Now we're going to get into this in greater depth when we move into the subject of demonology, but here we see that through fasting and prayer, God had sent an answer. But there was a spiritual war between the angel of the Lord and the wicked or the fallen angels, demon spirits. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness and principalities and powers in high places. We'll cover spiritual warfare with angels and fallen angels when we move into demonology coming up very soon. The spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, there it is highlighted. Then Michael, verse 13, then Michael... One of the archangels came to help me. Now, some of you that are very discerning and perceptive and analytical and you analyze and synthesize everything as you're reading, you've already spotted one of the archangels, plural. I'll come back to that. Verse 14, now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future for this vision concerns a time yet to come. This was a prophetic dream that had been given to Daniel. And uh, as you follow us when we study and speak and teach on eschatology, which we do most of the time in our uh, teaching formats, we're going to be learning a lot from the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, the book of First and Second Thessalonians, those four books perhaps more than any other uh, walk hand in hand in unfolding final eschatology, final end time Bible prophecy. But uh, let's get to the question because I know it will be asked. It's been asked before and I know many of you would want an answer to it. And the question would be formulated, most of you would say, if Michael is the only archangel, why in Daniel chapter 10 was he described as one of the archangels, plural? And a great question. First, two things to consider. The expression, one of the archangels, could be equally rendered in translation. In fact, some scholars believe it should be. Some of the Bible versions that you may have in hand as you're listening to me may translate it this way. The first of the archangels. But that doesn't fully answer the plural use of archangels in the text here, does it? We definitely have a plural. One of the archangels, Michael, one of the archangels, plural. And uh, so, first of all, remember this, and if you're taking notes, many scholars would say it would be a better rendering of the text to say the first of archangels. But again, what do we do with the plural? Well, many scholars believe that Lucifer was an archangel. 
because he was created with unique abilities and talents and a musical, miraculous, supernatural ability that no other angel has in heaven. Only Lucifer had that. Uh, we find that in Ezekiel, and I'll come back to that. That will be covered, by the way, thoroughly when we get into our study next on demonology and move from angelology to demonology. But because the possibility exists, and again, I'm not going to get it in, into it in depth because we're headed that way in demonology, but he was cast from heaven. So there is some debate uh, in the world of biblical academics that Lucifer was an archangel and Michael was an archangel and you had these two with the proper rendering from Daniel being the first of that Michael would have been perhaps the first archangel, Lucifer the second and Lucifer cast from heaven gives us only one archangel in heaven that being Michael Again, I'm throwing that out there for those of you who are more analytical and like a little more depth. I don't suggest that you try to explain this to your little boy or little girl, but we only have, don't miss this, we only have one archangel named in the entirety of the Bible, and that archangel is Michael. I want you to retain that, and I want you to have that in your biblical knowledge of angels. The only archangel in the Bible mentioned by name is Michael, period. And so because we lend our teaching style so strongly to just staying in the Bible and not trying to wander between the lines, I put a big exclamation on that for you. Uh, turn over to Daniel chapter 12. Uh, as again, this is a prophetic book, Daniel, uh, dealing with the end of time. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael, the archangel, who stands guard over your nation, will arise. Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since the nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. So what is the divine assignment of the archangel Michael? Well, we see here from Scripture that his specific assignment is to stand guard and to watch over the Jews and the nation of Israel. And so in your notes, important, the divine assignment of the archangel Michael uh, by now, you've heard me emphasize and re-emphasize and triemphasize that the only archangel mentioned by name in the Bible is Michael. What is his divine assignment? Well, primarily, we see him specifically protecting and guarding the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And you're going to see in further study that this ties into final Bible prophecy. Now, if I had time, uh, when it says Michael the archangel, uh, just to give you a picture, if you, were, uh, if you were at a Bible college or a seminary or you had the privilege of sitting at a table and having lunch with some PhDs and the discussions, uh, the debate going back and forth again, I want you to know that that debate exists so that when you hear perhaps preaching or teaching uh, from someone else that you may respect, if there's maybe a disagreement. Uh, now, if they try to tell you that Gabriel is an archangel, then they have crossed the line of biblical hermeneutics and exegesis. Because I said it before, I'll say it again, nowhere in the Bible is Gabriel called an archangel. It's just often attributed to him because of the significant events to which he was sent by God to be a messenger of. I mean, the angel sent to announce the birth of Jesus surely must be an archangel, correct? Well, the Bible doesn't say that, so therefore I can't say that. Uh, let's, let's use one more verse of scripture here. 
Let's go to the book of Jude, all the way in the back of your New Testament. Just before you get to the book of Revelation, Jude chapter 1, verse 9. Jude chapter 1, verse 9. There's only one chapter in Jude. But even Michael, one of, now this translation, uh, the NLT translated, translates it, even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But in probably most of the translations that you're reading, uh, Michael there is called the archangel. Uh, I know that he's called that in the King James, the New King James, uh, the NASB, New American Standard Bible, the ESV. Most translations, and it's Quite frankly, it's, it's the most accurate rendering of the Greek text. Jude verse one, verse, uh, excuse me, Jude chapter one, verse nine. Again, Michael is named as an archangel. One more passage, and then I'm going to close for today. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four, and go down to. Verse 16, First Thessalonians 4, verse 16, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, singular, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves, and I'll, I'll not read that entire passage. Now, uh, anyone who's been a follower of our ministry, you know that this is the classic passage that defines the next major prophetic event called the rapture of the church. But here we see that uh, the archangel is going to be the one who announces. The Bible says, with the trumpet call of God and the voice of the archangel, singular, is that angel Michael? Well, he's not called angel, uh, Archangel Michael by name in this classic rapture text, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. But if we've established that there's only one archangel named in the Bible and his name is Michael, then many scholars believe that it's a given that it is Michael who is given the assignment of inaugurating vocally the announcement of the rapture of the church. But again, being fair uh, to those theologians who try to establish more than one archangel, uh, then perhaps they might allow for uh, it being Gabriel or, I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is the only archangel. Now, I'll not even get in to the moronic theological twisting of scripture that they use to try to establish that fact. Obviously, they're trying to establish a narrative that meets their cultish doctrine, and they are a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. Can I be any clearer than that? Mormons are a cult. Can I be any clearer than that? Anytime you have other books that you hold as equal to the Holy Bible, you are a heretical cult. Stay away from them. Don't have discussions with them. Don't invite them into your house on Saturday when they knock on their door. I don't care if their shirts are white and their ties are pretty and they show up with chocolate chip cookies and free material. Keep them out of your house. There, there's no sense in, in most people, 99% of people would not have the training uh, to debate them. They're trained to bring confusion into your life if you're a believer and total deception if you're an unbeliever. But just so you'll know, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is the archangel of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. Again, uh, the, the level of biblical violation and interpretation, I'm trying to be gracious cannot be supported. I'll leave it at that. 
Though Michael the archangel is not specifically named in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16, since we only have one archangel ever in Old Testament and New Testament mentioned with that title of archangel, and that's Michael exclusively, then it seems again both logical and theological that Michael is the archangel of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. I'm going to stop there. I think we've covered a lot of material today. Again, this has not been exhaustive, but we are in the subject of angelology, and in this particular teaching that you've been listening to, lesson number three today, we've been talking about seraphim, cherubim, and archangel singular, and that would be Michael. So I think that's a great place to leave off. I would encourage you to get your Bible out and continue to read and to study. Go back and listen to these teachings repetitively until all of the information and content is like breathing in and out and be a devout student of the Bible all of the days of your life. That's what will keep you ready unto the soon coming of Christ. I never close a teaching or a broadcast or a message or a lost lamb event without giving people an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so I'm going to ask you a very serious question. Do you know beyond the shadow of all doubt that you have repented of sin, received Jesus Christ and Christ alone as your Savior and Lord? And are you living a Christian life? Let me make it more specific. Are you living your life as Christ did? Are you living holy? Are you living pure? Are you living blameless? Are you living sin free? If you're not ready to meet the Lord, will you make peace with God today? I'd like to pray with you. Many people call it a sinner's prayer. I'm fine with that terminology. But if you're not ready to meet the Lord or if you have any doubts, some of you maybe once knew the Lord and you're backslidden, you're away from God, you've wandered away from God, perhaps something traumatic happened in your life and you got mad at God. Sometimes people have a loved one that dies of a disease or they lose a child or uh, they get sick. Something happens that rocks their faith and they blame God and get mad at God and wander away. God is not the author of sin. God's not the author of sickness. God's not the author of your traumatic life problems. He's the answer. It's Satan who comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus Christ came that you might have life. If you have any question, will you pray with me right now? Where you spend eternity hinges upon this prayer. You need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. God doesn't want you to be unprepared. I certainly love you and don't want you to be unprepared. Our ministry exists specifically to help those of you that need Christ and to provide teaching and discipleship for you to grow. Pray this with me right where you're at, wherever you may be. Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of your holiness and your glory. So today I admit my sin and I'm willing to repent, to turn my back on sin. And this day, I turn my heart to Jesus. I want to be a child of God. I want to know that I'm forgiven. I want to have the peace of knowing it is well with my soul. So I receive salvation as the gift of God. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me the power to be what I ought to be and keep me ready for your soon coming is my prayer. And I pray in the name of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.